So, uh, but remind you before we get on the subject tonight about the omnipotence of God, I want to remind you and review about last week's study is about the omnipotence of God, the omnipotence of God. And as we started on the natural attributes of God, we started on the omniscience of God. And by what we mean by omniscience is that God knows all things and is absolutely perfect in his knowledge. We went over scripture that set forth the fact about God's omniscience. We also went over his knowledge is absolutely comprehensive. God has perfect knowledge of all that is in nature. God has perfect knowledge of all that transpires in human experience. God has a perfect knowledge of all that transpired in human history. God knows from, from all eternity to eternity what will take place. Then we summarize study five with what does this mean for the unbeliever? And we noted that Matthew chapter 12 verse 36 says that I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak on the day of judgment. The practical ramifications of the omniscience of God are many. Think, for instance, that what this means in relation to eternal security of the believer. If God knows all, then obviously nothing can come to light subsequently to our salvation which he did not know when he saved us. Well, think again what omniscient means when something tragic occurs in the believer's life. God knows and has known all about it from the beginning and is working all things out for his glory and our ultimate good. Now, that was the review and the recap from last week. Now we get into study uh, six, which we're talking about today is the omnipotence of God, the omnipotence of God. Now, as we break the word omnipotence, the first part is omni, which means all, and potent is power. The omnipotence of God is the attribute by which he can bring to pass everything which he wills. So in the beginning, God. So God in his solitariness was all by himself. And then we noted that when he spoke the world into existence, he did not have to gather up material, but he spoke the world into existence. And when he made that declaration, the power of his word brought forth the creation. And now the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, in divers time, God has spoke to men in various ways through dreams and visions and so forth on. But now he is speaking through his son, and we know his son is the word of God. So we know that the word of God is more powerful than any two ever so a person through the heart of man. But as we go back to Genesis chapter 1, it shows us that there is the creation when he spoke the world, when he said, let there be light. Just by him saying that, just by him declaring that, it was life. God's power admits of no bounds or limitations. God omnipotent does not mean the exercise of his power in doing anything inconsistent with the nature of things. It is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to sin. It's impossible for God to die, to make wrong right, or, to, or hatred of himself to be blessed. So when we look at this, God's declaration of his intention is pledge of the things intended being carried out. Have he said and shall he not do it? Is there anything too hard for God or is there anything that he does not have the power to do? Let's turn to Psalms 139. As we turn to Psalms 139, we're going to see how scripture, the scripture declaration of the fact that are in general with the omnipotence of God. Psalms 139, remember last week as we went over the omnipotency of God, we saw that um, in Psalms 139 that God knows all. But here we, we are, we're going to revisit Psalms 139 verses 12 through 16. Now he's talking about his omnipotent power. He says in Psalms 139, verse 12, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both like thee. Notice in verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins. And now when he talks about his reins, he's talking about his inner parts. Now he's going to talk about the power to fasten man in the womb. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works or power. 
and that my soul nor right will my substance was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought or work in the lowest part of the earth. Thy eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in the book of all my members were written which is contiguous with fashion or put together when as yet there was none of them. So we saw in Psalms 139 just by him fastening every man on the boy and girl born of a woman it takes the power of God. Well, let's turn over to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42 and just to remind you we're talking about scripture declaration of the fact um, in general of God's omniscience. Now as we turn to Job we know that here Job is at the end of his trial and here it is um, Job is uh, submitting um, to God and, and, and asking questions of what is going on. But notice in Job chapter 42, verse 2, I know that thou can do everything and that no thought can be withholding from thee or from you. So Job understands that God can do all things. Here it is um, that there is no purpose of thy own can be restrained. The mighty review of all God's words as it passes from before Job in this context bring forth the confession. There is no resistance thy might, and there is no purpose thou cannot carry out. But let's turn to another verse. It's in uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. And as we turn to Genesis 18, here it is. Christ is reiterating the Abrahamic covenant and here it is Abraham and Sarah is in their old age and Christ is coming to tell them that they will still have this son. Genesis chapter 18 notice in verse 14 is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. Now we already looked in Psalms 139 and we saw that God can touch the womb and create a human being. But here he says in Genesis 18:14, is anything too far for the Lord? What has ceased to be possible by natural means come to pass by supernatural divine power which is only of God. Now as we see in this scripture declaration, we just saw general facts of how God has power, and Job admitted that God can do anything, and we saw in Psalms 139 how God can create, but then it is also with an example in Genesis 18 and 14, but not only do we want to see the uh, scripture declaration of the facts, but next we want to move um, how the omnipotent power of God in the world of nature. While we're already in Genesis, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and as we turn to Genesis chapter 1, notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're talking about in the world of nature, we're talking about the omnipotence of God, and remind you that the omnipotence of God is that the omnipotence of God is the attribute by which He can bring to pass everything which He wills. God's power admits He has no bounds or no limitations. So He has all power in His hand. When He declare or decree something, it must come to pass. Well, let's see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Note that the Bible says, in the beginning, God. Now, we already noted in our textbook that in the solitariness of God, in the beginning, God, before He created anything, He was self-satisfied in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But notice that His power, He created the heavens and the earth. Now, He goes on to give us one of our examples of how He created the heavens and the earth. There's elaboration on the omnipotence of God and how He created the heavens and earth. Notice in verse 2. And the earth was without form, no matter, and born in darkness. It was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. But notice God said in verse 3, Let there be light. Thus He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. 
he does not need even to give his hand to work. His word is sufficient. His word is sufficient. Let's turn over to um, Psalms 107. Psalms 107. We're still talking about uh, the omnipotence the, um, of God in the world of nature. Psalms 107. Psalms 107. And as we think about God's power, we see how God is active in nature and that God has not left us to wind up a clock and just leave us by ourselves. God has this power over nature. Psalms 107, let's drop down to verse 25. Psalms 107, verse 25. Uh, as we're going over uh, Psalms 107, verse 25 to 29, we see he raises the storm and wind. He makes the storm to calm. Even the winds and the sea obey him. God's slightest word once uttered is standing law to which all nature must absolutely conform to his word. But let's turn over to Nahum. Nahum is in uh, the minor prophet. Uh, you got to go to Micah, and then after you go to Micah, it'll be Nahum. And then we're going to Nahum chapter 1, Nahum chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. Notice here in Nahum, um, Assyria, Babylon has captivated uh, Israel, and Israel is wondering how powerful is God and how is he going to deal with them. But notice how God responds to the prophet Nahum in Nahum chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. The mountain quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burnt at the present, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierce business of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. I noticed in Nahum it said the mountains quake at him, the hills melt, the earth is burnt at his presence, the rocks are thrown down by him. If such is his power, how shall Assyria withstand it? This is God's comforting message to Israel. Everything in the sky, in the sea, and on the earth is absolutely subject to his control and to his power. Now, remind you that we're talking about the omnipotence of God. We review scripture declaration of the fact of the power of God. We've seen in the world of the nature. The next, what about in the experience of mankind? Now, here we have uh, three examples. We have Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel uh, chapter 4, which uh, shows us the illustration of here it is. There's a king. He's elevating himself in pride, and before he can get all of this pride out to think that he is God and that he's doing anything, God powerfully makes this man like a beast to graze off the grass and eat grass and to be like an animal. But once he comes to the end of himself and God gives him back his mind, he declared the wonderful work of God. But we see how wonderful this is illustrated in the experience of Nebuchadnezzar, but also we want to look at in the conversion of Saul. And as you look at Acts chapter 9, here it is, Paul is kicking against the prince, he's persecuting the church, he's coming up against God, but on the road of the masses, God interrupts his life, and as he interrupts in his life, he invades his life, and he turns the most brutal creature against the Christian faith around and now he has exceeded and become great because God has converted him. But we saw here the illustration of the experience of Nebuchadnezzar and what he went through as a beast but at the end he gave God glory for all his power. Then we saw the conversion of Saul to Paul in Acts 9 as well as in the case of Pharaoh. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4 verse 11. Let's see that example of Pharaoh. Here it is. God has 